Amen. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, worthy is your name, Father Lord. Oh, we're here to praise you this morning. We're here to exalt you, Father Lord, to, to lift us up. So, Father, I pray that we can just forget about ourselves for a moment, that we can forget about uh, the cares and concerns that we have brought into to this sanctuary to worship you, Father Lord, and let us focus our hearts and minds totally on, on you. Lord, your word says that when we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. So I pray that you will bless each and every person who is here today, Father Lord, as they, as they seek to draw near to you. I pray that you would use me this morning, that you, you would uh, speak through me, that I would be your instrument or, or your weapon. Uh, Father, just uh, uh, give me your words to proclaim, Father Lord. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. They want to have a bulletin. If not, raise your hand. We'll get you a bulletin. There's an outline of today's sermon. Uh, you may want to follow along, fill in the blanks. And also, if you notice on the back where the, where the outline is, there's some scripture and some page numbers. And that corresponds to the Pew Bible in front of you. So if you want to follow along with the Pew Bible in front of you with the page numbers, I tried to make it as user-friendly as, as possible for you. So, Yeah, I read something one time, and maybe you have too, it's familiar, but it's a good reminder about what the dash represents between the two dates on the tombstone. And it goes like this. The dash on the tombstone is the most important time between the years. How we spend that time on earth, how we live, love, and laugh is all represented in that little dash. Make the most of your dash. Abraham Lincoln once said, it's, it's not the years and the life that count, but the life in the years that matter the most. Do you know what an a epitaph is? An epitaph is a short phrase that goes on a tombstone. And some famous epitaphs are, uh, that's all, folks, <laughs> that, by Mel Blanc from the voice of uh, Porky the Pig. And see if you can guess, guess this epitaph. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Martin Luther, that's right. And then, here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, stepped on the gas instead of the brake. <laughs> it's, it's an actual epitaph. Uh, in memory of an accident in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, but, but not to be morbid or anything, but what is your epitaph? If you had to write your epitaph, what, what would it be? What would represent that, that dash in your life? And this, this morning I want us to, to look at how we should live our lives so that dash can be represented well. Because this is the only time we have is, is today. So let's read, if you would, Matthew 25 starting in verse 14, page 1512, if you want to follow on in your, your pew Bible. And I want you to notice something as you're turning to this passage. That Jesus tells this parable, well, right before chapter 24. Or, or uh, chapter 24, right before it, he talks about end times. And then right after this parable, he talks about the day of judgment. So this, this parable here is squeezed in between uh, uh, the end times and the day of judgment. And this parable basically talks about Jesus coming again, his, his kingdom coming again. So we can be ready. So let's look at Matthew twenty five fourteen. Are you with me? Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents. Now some passages say bags of gold or something, which is, which is fine. Uh, a talent is just representative of a lot of money. It's uh, uh, not so much as your gifts or what you can do, but it's worth thousands and thousands of dollars. It's a lot of money. So bags of gold is fine, but just understand it represents a lot of money. To one he gave five talents of money. To another two talents. To another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents, he gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents brought another five. Master, 
he said. You have entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more for you. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. So here, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This parable begins with, again, it will be like. Now, what is it referring to here? Again, it will be like. It refers to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is talking about the, the kingdom of heaven that was mentioned in verse 1 of this chapter. Verse 1 says, at that time, which refers to the return of, of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is saying this parable uh, is what's going to take place when his kingdom comes. So if you would, look at your, your handouts. If you want to fill in number one, I want to look at three implications that Jesus talks about in this parable about his return. Three implications. Number one, we have to be faithful with what the Lord entrusts us with. We have to be faithful to what the Lord entrusts us with. You see, the master here was going on a long journey, and he took his, his possessions, he took his money, and he entrusted these things to his servants. And I want to apply this to, so how does that apply to our lives today? Has, has our master, who has gone away to heaven, and he says, I'm going to come back one day, has he entrusted us with anything? Absolutely. He's entrusted us with, number one, the Great Commission. If you would, keep your place where you're at. Look at Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, page 1521 in your pew Bible. <laughs> Sometimes when I haven't heard from people in a while, they say, I'm sorry, I would have written sooner, but what, I was just too busy, just didn't have the time. The truth is, they probably had the time, I just wasn't a priority in their, in their lives, right? And some of us say, well, you know what, I have no time to give the Lord. In fact, I have nothing to, to, to give the Lord, but the truth of it is, we, we all have something that we could give the Lord, Right? Whether it's two mites or whether it's a lot of, of, of money. As, remember, as the widow gave, she only gave a little bit of what she had, but the Lord found that more acceptable than the Pharisee who beat his chest and gave a lot. Right? Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Understand, our Master has gone away. And while He is gone, He has entrusted us with some things. It may not be bags of gold, but He has entrusted you with maybe material wealth, other material wealth. Maybe He's entrusted you with some people or, or, or souls. He's entrusted all of us with time, hasn't he? How we use our time uh, uh, should be for him. He's entrusted us with, with the Great Commission. For some of you, he's entrusted us with more talents than, than, than others. And like the master in the parable that we read who expected a prophet, 
Our Lord expects us to produce a profit for his kingdom for those things he has entrusted us with. You need to hear me. The Lord has entrusted us with some things that were to produce a profit for his kingdom with. And he's going to come back someday. That's the parable that Jesus is talking about. He is going to, to come back someday. And we're to use all that God has blessed us with for his kingdom, to produce a profit for, for his kingdom. One time I went to the University of the Incarnate Word. Uh, Maritza was taking a test there, so I was just hanging around, walking around. And they had a big poster on, the, on one of the hallway uh, uh, hallways. And it had on, t- on top of the poster, it says, Before I die, I want to, and then fill in the blank. So the students could come by and, and write down what they wanted to do before they die. And I just wrote down seven of them. There were, there were hundreds of things that the students wrote down. Before I die, one student wrote, I want to find Nemo. <laughs> okay. Before I die, I want to drive across the United States. Before I die, I want to look at Earth from space. Before I die, I want to swim with the sharks. I want to find my soulmate, wrote another one. I want to find a cure for cancer, wrote another. And then one wrote, I want to run a marathon. Before you die, what do you want to do? Fill in the blank. Before I die, what is going to be your epitaph? What is going to represent the dash in your life? What is it you're striving for now that will matter for eternity, that will produce a profit for the kingdom of God? Or is everything that you're striving for have a temporary worldly focus? Things that you just can't take with you. You see, now is the only time we have to build up treasures in heaven. This is the only time we, we have. So I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm going to use my time wisely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work hard at producing a profit for the kingdom of God. Whatever years I have left on this earth, or days or hours, I don't know. I don't know, but I want you to notice something, is we're going to make one of two responses to what the Lord has blessed us with. We're either going to produce a prophet, as the two servants did, or we're going to hide our talents through neglect or, or selfishness. But that's one of the two responses that we're going to have to what the Lord has, has blessed us with, to produce a prophet for his kingdom. And in this parable, Jesus is teaching us to be faithful, to take what God has blessed us with and use it for his kingdom and his purposes and not to find Nemo. Okay? Number two. Number two. We will settle accounts one day. One day we're going to settle accounts. For some of you, that may strike fear into your hearts, but those who are faithful, what the Lord has blessed you with, you have nothing to fear. If you look at verses 19 through 25 of Matthew 25, well, look at, look at verse 19. We're not going to read the, the whole thing because I already read it, but I just I want to focus on verse 19. It says, After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled the accounts with them. See, one day, we're going to have to settle accounts with Jesus. One day, we're going to have to stand before him, and he's going to ask, what did you do with all that I, I blessed you with? And we're going to say, Lord, well, I, I knew you were a hard, hard master, so you know what? I, I was just, I kept my nose clean, and I didn't do anything. I just, I just uh, 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 tried to live a good life, and uh, that's not going to be pleasing to him, is it? You see, the Lord wants to at least try. I promise he will, not, he will not get on anybody. He will not punish anybody. He at least tries. Uh, there was a six-year-old Tom. He tried making pancakes for his parents one day. He watched his mother make it many times, so he wanted to surprise his mom and dad and make pancakes for him. So he, he 
opened up the, the refrigerator and he got the milk out and dropped the milk all over the floor and then he, he dropped the eggs and he, he got flour all over the place and his pajamas were full of flour and a sticky mess and on the floor and he started crying and he looked up and his dad was at the door and he thought, that's it, I'm going to get a whooping now. And he started crying even, even worse. But his dad just picked him up, hugged him and loved him. And you know, that's what our Heavenly Father does for us. We, we try to do something good for Him. We try to do, serve Him in some capacity, some way, and we may make a mess of things. But He says, you know what, at least you're trying. At least you're trying. And He just, he just hugs us and, and, and picks us up and, and loves us. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And understand something, only those things that are done for Christ will last. Only those things that are done for Christ. See, you could do a lot of good works through a lot of worldly organizations, but if it's not done for Christ, if it's not done in the name of Christ, if it's not done so that he gets the glory, then who gets the glory? You do or the organization. So it's not done for Christ, then, is it? Only those things done for Christ will last. And if you don't believe me, read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 5. But Jesus tells us to be ready. To be ready for his return, because one day we're going to settle accounts. And we're not to just be passively waiting, keeping our, our noses clean and hiding and hoarding what he has blessed us with. You can't take it with you. Right? Some of you, the Lord has blessed financially, and I don't know why you're holding on to it. Let it go. Let it go. You can't take it with you, so you might as well let, let the Lord use it. You know what I've discovered is this. You cannot outgive the Lord. And if you say, Lord, I just want to be a conduit of your blessings, you know, the, the more you give away, the more he's going to bless you, because now he's found a servant that he could work through to be a blessing to others. You see, but if you're going to be like the Dead Sea, you know why the Dead Sea is dead, don't you? Because it has no output, just the input, input, and no, no output. You can't outgive God. And some of you, the Lord has blessed materially in, in other ways. Some of you, the Lord has blessed with talents that you could serve within the church and, and, and the body of Christ. Let's look at number three. You will receive your due reward or condemnation. This parable teaches that the faithful service will be rewarded and unfaithful service will be punished. But let's look at the reward first. Look at verse 21. And Jesus tells us that our reward will be threefold. We will receive a threefold reward. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. So the first thing we're going to receive from the Lord is commendation. Commendation. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Phil, can you imagine what that day is going to be like? Imagine that, you're standing before the Lord Jesus one day, right? You're standing before him, and, and you know, you're, you're in heaven, and you see Jesus eye to eye, right? And he comes up to you and says, Phil, well done, good and faithful servant. I think the Lord will be taller than you, though. <laughs> okay. 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 But I... I can't imagine what that would be like to, to look into the eyes of the Lord and, and when, when our eyes meet, a smile comes across his face and he comes up to me and says, well done, good and faithful servant. We can just stop there. I don't need any more reward, right? I don't need any more reward. I've received my reward in full, but, but it doesn't stop there, does it? it? It doesn't stop there with just a combination. He says, I will, I will give you greater trust. He says, I will put you in charge of of many things. And I believe that that begins here on earth. 
that when we're faithful with even the small things that he has blessed us with, he will entrust us with more. And then as we're faithful with those things, he will entrust us with more and more and more. But if we're just going to hoard what he's blessed us with, he's not going to bless us with more. He's not going to trust us with, with more things and, and, and greater things. Amen? And then C says, we will share in the master's happiness. You know, one of the greatest pictures of heaven is sitting at the table, the banquet table, the wedding supper of the Lamb. If you would, look at Revelation 19, page 1889 in your pew Bible. Revelation 19, starting in verse 7, page 1889. As a pastor, I get to share in people's lives in great ways and in wedding ceremonies and, and in funerals. I get to share in the worst times of their lives and the greatest times. But the most joyous time in a person's life, and I get to, to see and share in that time, is a wedding ceremony. That's the most joyous time. And that's why the, 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 the table here is compared to the wedding supper of, of the Lamb. Revelation 19, verse 7 through 9. Are you with me? Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are true words of God. What a joyous time that will be. I'm here to tell you, there are no vegans at that table. Okay? We're going to have brisket. We're going to have sausage. Okay? <laughs> okay? We're going to have cookies, pumpkin pie, apple pie, ice cream. You know, eat to your heart's content. Amen? It's going to be a joyous time. We're, we're, and the master says, come. Sit at my table, sharing my happiness. Share in my happiness. You see, that's the sign of a true friend. Oswald Chambers, I believe it was, said, people will be glad to share their sorrows with anybody, anybody who's willing to hear, but they will only share their joy with a true compassionate friend. And the Lord says, I want to share my joy with you. Not only that, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to give you greater trust, greater blessings. Now I want you to come and share in my happiness. Come and share in, in my joy. Sit at my table. Uh, you know, what a great thought that is. But now is the time to be building your treasures in heaven. We all have the same dash, don't we? We all have that same time. We don't know how much time we have but in, in that dash. But what you do with that dash makes all the difference for eternity. Do you understand that? What you do with that little dash makes all the difference for eternity. Make good use of that dash now in service for the Lord. Take what the Lord has blessed you with and use it to profit his kingdom. Because he says, one day I'm going to settle accounts. You know, I wish I could uh, stop here. But we got one more servant to look at, don't we? Right? Let's look at that, that third servant. What did, what, what did he receive? He, re he didn't receive commendation. He received condemnation. He received condemnation. And in verse 26, uh, in repeating what the slaves charge against him, he's not admitting that it's true, but he's saying, if it were true, you should have at least put my money on interest, right? The master did not say, well done, good and faithful servant. No, he didn't. He said, you wicked and lazy servant. I don't know about you. Those are not the words I want to hear. Right? Not the words I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hear. Secondly, he received a loss of trust. Verses 28 and 29. 
It says, what was given to him was taken away. And then he was cast outside into hell and darkness. There was no banquet for him. There was no celebration, no, no celebration in the master's happiness. You know, he, he would live to regret his unfaithfulness. Verse 30 says, And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, if an invitation to share in the master's happiness is a representation of what heaven will be like, then this is a representation of what, what hell is going to, to be like. Now, understand something. This can only mean one thing. That this servant that we're talking about here was an imposter. This servant was not a believer in Jesus Christ. Because you cannot lose your salvation as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ. He was, he was not saved. In fact, he didn't really know the master. How, how do I know that, pastor? Uh, well, I, I want you to look at something. Look back at this, this passage, right? And it says... Uh, It says you didn't you, you sowed where, where you uh, you didn't plant and you reaped where where you didn't harvest. Now is is that true? Is that, is that what Jesus Christ is that what our Master does? No, no. In fact, we, we know that's not true. Uh, this slave believed his master to be cruel. This slave believed his master to be a thief. This slave believed his master to be an, an opportunist. To, to be ruthless. But we know by the way that this master dealt with his other two servants that that's not true. So that tells me that this slave here did not really know his master. He didn't know his master. He, he was an imposter. He was not a believer in Jesus Christ. And, and unfortunately, we, we have people like that in, in, in the church today. They're not true servants. They're, they're, they're not really saved. You know, they, they may come to church. They may do all the right things. They may even give money. But they're, they're not really saved. They don't use their, their gift within service to, to the kingdom. They may look like a Christian. They may even act like a Christian. They can even talk like a Christian. But the attitude of their heart reveals who their real master is. And it appears that an unwillingness to serve and be faithful to what the Lord has blessed them with will reveal who the true servant is. Jesus said, by their fruit, you will recognize them. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, I don't want you to think that we're saved by works. I don't want you to get that idea that we're saved by, by works. But works give evidence to our salvation. If you would, look at Ephesians chapter 2, page 1777 in your pew Bible. Look at verse 8, 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not by what? Not by works. You cannot save yourself by works. That means baptism can't save you. That means going to church can't save you. That means tithing can't save you. That means being a pastor can't save you. That means being a deacon can't save you. That means if your mama and daddy were Christians, that means that can't save you either. Works cannot save you. We're saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ. So we're not saved by works, but we're saved for works. Look at verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to what? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. One day, Jesus is going to come back and settle accounts. And he's going to ask, what did you do with all that I entrusted you with? Lord, I kept it safe. I hid it. I kept my nose clean. I hoarded it. 
That's not the sign of a true servant, if you're looking at Jesus' parable, is it? Because if you're a true servant, you're going to want to produce fruit for the kingdom of God. You're going to want to use what he has blessed you with for the kingdom of God. There's one word that describes people today. One word. Busy. Busy. I'm too busy to pray. I'm too busy to read the Bible. I'm too busy to go to church. I'm too busy to get involved in God's work. I'm too busy. And I'm here to tell you, you are busier than God ever intended you to be. And are you busy doing the right things? Because we could be busy doing the wrong things. You could be busy serving the kingdom of this world rather than the kingdom of, in heaven. What do you want that dash to represent? I'm not saying let's all quit our jobs and go into the ministry. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is this. Where God has placed you is the ministry. Where God has placed you is the ministry. I was talking to uh, Tim the other day. Uh, and, and Tim wants to, to be able to uh, have a greater impact on the kingdom of God. And just talking to him where he is at work he has witnessed to, to countless people already. He's being used right where the Lord has him. And I am sure that as Tim continues to step out in faith, the Lord is going to entrust him with greater areas of responsibility, great, greater opportunities to, to, to share the gospel, greater opportunities to be used by the Lord. And that's not just for Tim. That's for each and every one of us. So you are in the ministry. Do you understand that? All of us are in the ministry. There are different degrees within the ministry. There are some leaders within the ministry. I'm a leader. Deacons are leaders within the church. But we're all in the ministry. Do you understand that? So what are you using your gifts for within the kingdom of God? You see, I can't reach the people you can. Why? Because I'm in my office preparing sermons all day. <laughs> that's, that's the truth of it. I can't be out there where you are with the people every day. You can have a greater impact on the kingdom of God than I can. Do you understand that? You can have a greater impact on the kingdom of God than I can. What are you doing with your gifts? What are you doing with your gifts? You see, if you're busy, too busy to do kingdom work and produce fruit for the kingdom of God, then you really have to ask yourself, am I truly saved? What, what servant represents my life? Do, does a servant who just hoards what the Lord has blessed him with and, and does nothing for the kingdom of God, who shows that he doesn't even know his master? You see, let's use this time now to examine our lives. The, the point of this sermon is not to lay a guilt trip on you by no means. The point of the sermon is I want you to examine your lives right now. I want you to examine your lives and to see where you're at. I don't care what you did a year ago. I don't care what you did 10 years ago, 50 years ago. What are you doing right now for the kingdom of God? Oh, you know, but I'm old. Turn to Psalm 92, 14, if you would. Page 871 in the Pew Bible. You know, there, there's no disqualifier that I've read in the, in the Bible where someone was too young or too old to be used by God. In other words, if you still got a pulse, Lord expects you to be doing something for the kingdom of God. And I understand some of you have just cannot physically do the things you used to do. I get that. Lord gets that. But what can you do? Can you pray? Can you read the Bible? Can you encourage the saints within the service? You know, uh, maybe you can't be running the race anymore, but you can be in the stands cheering the people on, right? I know as a pastor, boy, I, I can use that sometimes, and other leaders within the church. We, we can use your encouragement and, and your prayers especially. I love it when people come up and tell me, Pastor, I'm praying for you. That, that warms my heart. And that also tells me that's the reason that the Lord's using me is because you're praying for me. If you quit praying for me, the Lord will quit using me. It's just that simple. Just that simple. 
He may use me, but not in greater capacities, as if everybody was praying for the pastor. Look at 92, 14. They will still bear fruit in an old age. They will still stay fresh and green, Procla- proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Boy, that, that's my prayer. Lord, I want to bear fruit in an old age. I want to stay fresh and green. I, I want to I wanna burn out. I don't want to rust out, right? I, I want to be, be serving the Lord till the day I die. Look at one more passage, 7118, since you're in the psalm already. 7118. You know, I believe that there's a revival waiting to happen on the church rolls. I believe that. Because many think they are servants of God when they're not. Many think they're servants of God when they're not. You know, the heart shows otherwise. And revival usually happens when church members get saved. That's when revival happens, when church members get saved, when they get right with God, when they get serious about serving God and the kingdom of God. Look at 7118. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Is the Lord done with you yet just because you're old and gray? No, you can stay fresh. You can bear fruit for the kingdom of God. I saw a war room last night on DVD for the first time. and You know, her, her, her ministry was what? Prayer in that war room. And then she discipled someone else to learn how to pray. Don't tell me the Lord can't use you. The problem is you're probably not doing anything for the kingdom of God. There's a lot here who do, okay? But the reason I say that is I really want you to examine your life, okay? Really examine your life, what the Lord, what you're doing for the Lord. Because only what you do for the Lord will last, will will count in the end. Don't be like the third servant. If I had a premise statement for this sermon, it would be, don't be like the third servant. Question your dash right now to make sure you're not the third servant. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He didn't say talk about my will. He said only those who do my will. See, we can talk about his will all day long. We can talk about his will in church. And as soon as we leave here, we just... Forget about it. See, that's the problem, I think, in in America today is there's there's Christians who really aren't living for the Lord. They're, They're on the fence. And you need to choose this day whom you're going to serve. You're gonna you need to choose this day who you're gonna make a profit for. Because if you're not living for God, then you're, you're living for the devil. And I don't know about you, I, I want to stand before God one day, and I want him to look me in the eye and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to entrust you with many things. Come and share in my happiness. That's what I want to hear, and I know that's what you want to hear. So examine, examine your life today. Examine your life today. Is there any fruit in your life to show When you stand before God, when we have to give an account for everything that we have talked about, everything that we have said, all that he has blessed us with, when we stand before him and have to settle accounts one day, are you going to have anything to show? What's the desire of your heart? You might make a mess of things like six-year-old Tommy who tried making pancakes, but that's okay. The Lord says, get out there and try. Get out there and try. That's, That's the important thing, right? So I want to encourage you today, I want to challenge you today to reprioritize your life, to start living for the Lord and not for yourself. The Lord saved you for bigger things than to get a big paycheck. What do you, is that what you want your epitaph to read? He made a lot of money. So, right? So, what do you want your epitaph to read? Start living it now. Amen? Let's pray. Father, Lord, your word tells us that, that we should examine ourselves now to see whether we are in the faith or not. 
Lord, I pray that if someone here today realizes that they're not in the faith, that they realize Christ Jesus is, is not their Lord, that they fail the test. Father, I pray that this would be the day that, that they would surrender their lives to you. If there's any doubt in their mind, Father, let them come forward at the time of invitation. But Father, there, there are others here who, well, perhaps they need to reprioritize their lives, that they have not been living for you as they should. They've been busy, but they haven't been busy doing your kingdom work, doing the things of God. So, Father, I pray that we would all use what you have blessed us with for your kingdom, that we could make a profit for your kingdom, Lord. That we would not just live for our paycheck, we would not just live to get a bigger TV, a bigger car, a bigger house, but we would be content with what we have. And that we would seek to please you. So, Father, use this, this sermon because I pray that there's not one person here today that would ever hear at the end of their lives away from me. I never knew you. Depart from me into the darkness. Father, search our hearts now. Help us to respond to this message. 